understand, as Brother Stan has indicated, that you're following a theme entitled Bible Basics with appropriate sub-themes at various times. And I also understand that the sub-theme for this week and the following five weeks, four weeks rather, is Men and Women of Faith. With each of the five weeks in total, focusing on a particular man and woman revealed in Scripture. And this week being the first of the five, the focus is on Abel, who is the first example of a man of faith to appear in the Bible, being mentioned in Genesis 4 verse 2 as the second born son of Eve. Adam and Eve, he was the second born. What I say on the matter, as it's the first address of this particular sub theme, needs to address some foundational points on which the later speakers can build if they so desire. Thus we need to establish what is meant by faith, firstly by looking at the simple English dictionary definition, and then by looking at what the scripture has to say on the subject. Then we need to understand why this is an important element, more than that, a vital matter, and finally to see how its existence in a man and woman can be demonstrated. Our task is made more difficult by the fact that the reference to Abel as an individual man number only twelve. Eight in the Old Testament and four in the New. There are four other references to Abel, but they're related to a city called Abel in three cases, and the other to a great statue, a great stone rather, erected called Abel near Beth Shemesh. Thus you'll appreciate that, the, that to deal with the sub-theme, as it relates to Abel, will need some wide-ranging considerations, a bit of digging, which might not always appear connected with the subject at first sight. So let's start by establishing what is meant by faith in our English language. Not too difficult a task where all we need to do is get hold of a decent dictionary and turn up the, the word and see what that says. I was using the Oxford Illustrated, not for any particular reason, except that it was a cheap edition when I bought it. Here, from that dictionary, we learned that faith means the following things. First of all, complete trust or confidence Secondly, firm belief, especially without logical proof. Thirdly, religious belief. And fourthly, a duty or commitment to fulfil a trust or a promise and so on. In other words, to keep faith. You promise to do that, you'll keep faith by doing it. So it's not difficult to see that in biblical applications, all of those definitions are appropriate. And that the second one is pe peculiarly fitted for Abel, his being so early in the history of our race. Later examples of men and women of faith may well have had some previous experience of the power of God to fall back on. But Abel will have had less time to develop such experience, or experience that's plural. The dictionary definitions given above can be used to sum up by that first one we specified. Complete trust or confidence. That is a feeling of certainty that what the eternal creator has said he will do or what will actually take place is bound to happen and can thus be relied upon absolutely without question. So having laid out what the word faith means in our own native tongue, let's see what further information we can obtain about the meaning of the word in Bible terms. Now it's surprising, it was to me anyway, surprising to discover that the noun faith only occurs twice in the Old Testament. That the re relevant Hebrew word, anun, a, a moon, sorry, A Y M O O N. That's the way you pronounce it. It's not quite spelt that way. In one case, and imuna, the feminine of the same word in the other case, are only translated faith once each. There are other translations given, but only as faith once each. Amun is given as faithful a further three times, whilst imuna, the feminine, is translated faithful three times, faithfully six times, and faithfulness eighteen times. Now there are words which are related to these words, such as or man, which is the primitive root from which a moon is, is, is derived. Given as faithful, an adjective, a describing word, remember, remember, such as a faithful man or a faithful woman, and faithfully, an adverb, a describing word of a word of action, such as she worked faithfully. There are other words which are used and related to the ones we've mentioned to, to give those meanings. As a noun, Faith appears in the New Testament much more frequently. I counted 244 times 
in Strong's concordance. Now I may have miscounted, but it's round about that. 243 of them were the same word. A Greek word, P-I-S, T-I-S, pistis, means conviction of truth of anything. It's related to God with the conviction of the truth of God, that God exists and is a creator and ruler of all things, the provider and bestower of eternal salvation through Christ. The odd one out is a word called oligophistos, used by the Lord Jesus in respect of those with a lack of faith, not faith but a lack of faith, such as in Matthew 6 verse 30. The Old Testament words emun or emuna do not yield that same certainty of meaning as does pistis, being given as established, by figure, trusty, for emun, and firmness, faithfulness, faithfulness rather, truth and honesty for emuna. They go in the same direction as the Greek word does, but their meanings are not as direct. However, our little investigation shows that the biblical words convey the same sense of meaning as does that first meaning given in our Bible dictionary. Complete trust or confidence. Now, we recall that we suggested that all the specific meanings to the word faith given in the dictionary applied in biblical examples of the faith that we come across. Those four were complete trust or confidence, firm belief, especially without logical proof, religious belief, and duty or commitment to fulfil a trust or a promise and so on. And we urged that the second of those, firm belief without logical truth, would have a particular and a peculiar relevance to Abel in view of his early appearance on the human scene in Genesis chapter 4. Now you may well recall that we indicated that he would have had little experience upon which to draw to reinforce his own faith at that time. But whatever experience he had to draw upon, to consider, to think about, by way of confirming what he saw and heard, nevertheless he believed and he acted in accordance with that belief. He understood something of what God had revealed and he acted in accordance with it. <coughs> we said that Abel has 12 references in the Bible, 8 in the Old Testament and 4 in the New. All the Old Testament ones occur in Genesis 4. The New Testament ones occur in twice in the Gospels, Matthew, and one, Matthew 23, Luke 11, and twice in Hebrews, 11 verse 4 and as we read, and uh, 12 verse 4. So we'll have a look at these to find out what's recorded there. We saw in, or we can see in, uh, in Genesis chapter 4 verse 2, a simple statement that Eve had born Abel, a brother to Cain, the firstborn. And alongside that, we see that Cain was a, a keeper of sheep, he was a shepherd, he looked after sheep, whilst Cain was a tiller of the ground. Now those things may appear at first sight to be simple throwaway remarks, just making weight as you like, if, if you like. But believing as I do, and I know others believe this as well, that nothing in scripture is recorded by chance, there is no padding, there is no throwaway remarks, it all has a meaning and a purpose if we can discover it, believe in that, then we wonder what caused the spirit within Moses who wrote Genesis, in fact he wrote the first five books of the Bible what caused him to remark to note that um, Abel was a keeper of sheep and that um, Cain was a tiller of the ground we don't see them as being simply two items of a biographical nature we have to go back in chapter 3 we can read of the act of disobedience committed by Eve Eve first of all and then confirmed in what appears to be a more deliberate fashion by Adam. If you look at, we're not going to turn it, because our time is limited, but if you look at 1 Timothy 2 verse 14, the Apostle Paul makes it clear when he specifies that Adam was not deceived, and specifically points out that Eve was deceived. The reference is to the conversation which she had had with the serpent when he commented to her, Hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Bullinger, and I use him a lot, he's, he gives me a lot of useful information. <coughs> you have to do it with discretion, but it's there to, to be dug into. Bullinger says that this was not in the form of a question, 
but rather of a challenge such as, can it be that God has set so and so? Whatever it was, it drew an answer from Eve, indicating that they could eat of all the trees of the garden that they lived in, save one, in respect of which God had said that they were not to eat of it, nor to touch it, lest ye die. Now from this it would appear that the moral imperative involved in not eating of the tree, tree of knowledge of good and evil, that is, it should not be eaten because Yahweh had forbidden it, that that had been lost sight of or have been rationalised in the way that we humans often do if we've got difficult situations we rationalise them and explain them away for our own satisfaction it seems that Eve seems to have thought that the tree was forbidden because it was poisonous and thus deadly hence she answered the statement that of not touching the tree which was not part of the divine proscription he hadn't said that, God had not said that she added that as it were and it may have come to her from Adam, we don't know that. He may, Adam may have underlined the importance of not eating the tree by saying, don't touch it, Eve. keep away from it. But we don't know that. Whatever it was, it could have been simple embarrassment by Eve. That was not the command. The command was don't eat of it. The serpent then said to her that she would not surely die. But the prohibition was really about God wishing to prevent an enhancement of knowledge by the two humans. That's the reasoning of the flesh. He knows if you eat that, you get extra information that he doesn't want you to have, either at all or just for the time being. So Eve was deceived into eating the, the tree, the fruit of the tree. The temptation that she submitted to was f falling into the threefold category referred to by John in 1 John 2 verse 16. There emphasised as the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life. All of those three are listed in Genesis 3 verse 6. When you read it, you can see that they're drawn out as the things that shouldn't be done. Then having eaten because you've been deceived, Eve gave the fruit to Adam. And we know that Adam ate without being deceived. His eyes were wide open as to what was going on. So he made a deliberate choice, and therefore we might conclude that Adam was more guilty than was Eve. Well, that's an aside. Following their disobedience, the two were found hiding in the garden, having made a covering for thy nakedness as the fig trees, fig leaves sewed together. As an aside, we know that they would have known that they were naked beforehand. It wasn't as if they, they had their eyes shut and couldn't see. But the significance of the nakedness was not apparent to them beforehand. They hadn't got the knowledge to put two and two together. Once they had done that, they would then felt ashamed for more than one reason and sewed fig leaves together. The mighty ones, that's what the Hebrew word Elohim means, the mighty ones empowered by the eternal creator, then faced them, revealed the, their fate, cursed the ground so that henceforth their subsistence would be as a result of hard, sweaty labour. In the, in the sweat of thy face thou shalt eat bread. And made them a more suitable covering of the skin or the skins, we don't know whether there's one animal slain or more than one, of a slain animal, probably a lamb, may have been lambs so they made them a covering that reflected the new situation and to make that covering animals had to die blood had to be shed that's a divine principle which appears elsewhere in scripture <coughs> and it pointed forward to to the way in which the eternal creator would set aside their disobedience without in any way violating his own righteousness and justice he'd do that by a man of his providing namely the lord jesus christ and then later on, not too long, not too long afterwards, they were driven out of the garden. And the way of the tree of life, which the serpent, we believe, felt they could go and get over, oh, eat that, go and eat that, it'd be all right. The way of the tree of life was, was contained, was restricted, was kept by a, an angel with a flaming sword. So coming back to remarks then in Genesis 4 verse 2, we can draw some conclusions which we can't prove but we can draw them and feel they're reasonable that Abel chose to work with sheep because it was from them that the sin of his parents had been covered temporarily and this would indicate that this younger son had a spiritual element in his personality on the other hand Cain chose to work by tilling the ground that element which had been cursed because of the disobedience of his parents you'll earn your bread by hard work so the ground's going to have bring up uh, thistles and weeds and thorns and so on. And other things, nettles and all sorts of things that make it more difficult to grow food. 
He was saying that this didn't trouble Cain, indicating that, that his disposition was that of a worldly man. Sometime later, a few verses later in, in Genesis 4, the two men came to make an offering before God, before Yahweh, and although no further details are given, it seems probable that the time and the place and the type of the offering would have been previously specified. That is indicated by the outcome as recorded in verses 4 and 5 of Genesis chapter 4. Abel's offering was accepted. Why? Because it involved the slaying of a goodly animal and showing that death was that which disobedience brings about and shedding blood. Without the shedding of blood, the scriptures tell us, there is no remission, no remission of sins. So Abel understood that and made an appropriate offering the best of his flock, which of course requires some sort of a sacrifice, in the mind at least. Cain, <coughs> offering from the fruit of the ground, had his offering rejected. Now it's inconceivable that acceptance and rejection would have been on a capricious basis. Oh, I don't fancy that, so I reject that, and I do fancy that, so I approve that. God doesn't work that way. He's a, he's a, a being of the utmost integrity and compassion and graciousness and consistency. All that's revealed about the eternal deity in scripture indicates that he is just, he is fair, and he is full of compassion. As can be seen to have operated in, the, in respect of Adam and Eve. Just, yes. Fair, yes. Compassionate, yes. They weren't killed off. Off you go. They were given a hope in Genesis 3 verse 15. Exodus 34 verse 6. Speaking of Moses, remember Moses said to the angel, the powerful one, and I think it was probably Gabriel, show me thy glory. And the angel said, I can't do that. If I do that, it will kill you. Stand on that rock in the cleft, and I'll put my hand across your face, and I'll pass by, and when I've gone by, I'll remove it so you can see my afterglow. Rather like watching the headlights of a car going away from you. You're not looking into them, you're just seeing the glow, that which is illuminated by the glow. And he went on then in the next chapter, that was in Exodus 33, in Exodus 34 verse 6, the angel declares, this is the glory of God, physical glory, yes, in the previous chapter, now a moral glory. The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the children, the fathers upon the children, and upon the children's children, unto the third and fourth generations. Now it's a comprehensive set of attributes. And some think, well that's not fair is it? Why blame the children? What the fathers did, and going down the generations. If you look in earlier chapters, Exodus 20 gives a, a more comprehensive decision on this, but Exodus 20 verse 5, where it's made clear that this condemnation applies to those people who hate Yahweh, hate God through their generations. <coughs> Deuteronomy 5 verse 9 also sets out the same thing. Hate God, receive back from him vengeance. Love God, receive from him compassion. That's a simple equation. In Nahum chapter 1 verse 3 we find a very powerful statement. Yahweh is slow to anger. It doesn't say he won't anger. I won't be angry, but he's slow to anger. And we can find many of the statements giving similar indications as to the essential elements of the attributes of the eternal deity, all pointing to the same thing, that Yahweh is not unjust and does not punish people or reject their offerings for not doing or bringing that of which they knew not. He doesn't say you didn't know, but I'm still going to punish you. That wouldn't be fair, would it? But they knew, and we believe therefore that both Abel and Cain knew. Now, there's an excellent example of people not being punished for not knowing in 1 Samuel chapter five, chapters 5 and 6. The context there, which I'll explain to you, is the Israel fighting yet again against the Philistines, not, like, not much like, unlike today, with the Palestinians fighting in the same area, the Gaza Strip and so on. This is in the days of Eli, <coughs> when he judged Israel. <coughs> Beaten initially by the Philistines, Israel was regrouped, went back, regrouped, got the Ark of the Covenant, which they saw as a magic talisman, go out with this and we're bound to defeat them. The, Israel, the Philistines said, well, then they were troubled at first, and then quit yourself like men. You're going to have to fight for yourself. So the Philistines fought again, and Israel were once again defeated. And this time, the Philistines captured the Ark and took it off with them. 
and set it before thy god Dagon the fish god in Ashdod and he was found the following day flat on his face so they reset him up picked him again and the following day he was found not just on his face but with his head and his hands cut off so they realised that there was a problem here the people of Ashdod suffered grievously with hemorrhoids and so they sent the ark of passing on to Gath let them have gone they suffered, then on to Akron, they suffered, both had the same sort of problems, and eventually they realised that they needed to return the ark to Israel, but they didn't know how to do it. How can we send it back without getting further trouble? So they concluded that they would put it on a new cart, drawn by two milk cows which had not previously been yoked, and having put golden peace offerings of shake of emeralds and of um, mice, in the cart with the ark, they turned it loose and let the cattle wander, wander back to Israel. The way it was moved was not in accordance with the instructions given by God to Moses hundreds of years before. But because the Philistines did not know any better, they didn't know those instructions, and because they sought to do that which they felt might please Yahweh, in their ignorance, their efforts and their offerings were accepted. Thus we feel that both Abel and Cain would have known what Yahweh required but only Abel was obedient his offering was accepted Cain did not have regard to what God required but offered according to his own will and was thus rejected the outcome was that in a fit of jealousy Cain smote Abel that he died Eve later on had another son called Seth whom she saw as having been given by God to replace Abel and Seth was a faithful son the New Testament reference are in Matthew 23 where we find the Lord Jesus Christ in the midst of a long address condemning the hypocritical attitudes of the scribes and Pharisees <coughs> and in the midst of it he declares that Abel was a righteous man righteous which was a testimony of the most powerful nature and he gives a similar testimony in Luke, verse, Luke chapter 11 again stating that the killing of Abel was something that that generation his generation then with him would be required to answer for Paul referred to Abel twice in his, in his letter to the Hebrews, in 11 verse 4, which we read, where he says that Abel witnessed by Yahweh, Yahweh witnessed to his righteousness, because he offered up his gifts, a more excellent sacrifice than that, that offered by Cain, as a consequence of his faith. And he goes on to state to us, Paul, that, that by Abel's faithful sacrifice, he was still speaking, as it were, down the generation, hundreds of years afterwards, he was 4,000 almost. He was still speaking as to his faithfulness in doing that which Yahweh required. In the next chapter, Hebrews 12, verse 24, Paul again speaks about this time in relation to the fact that good though Abel's example is, that of the Lord Jesus Christ is better, infinitely better, because Christ mediated a new covenant which allows men and women to be reconciled to God in consequence of their faith in the offering which the Lord Jesus made. Thus we have no doubt about the quality of Abel's faith, and we can conclude that he had understood that what the eternal deity required of him. He required a sacrifice of the right thing, a sacrificial offering, pointing forward to the offering that would be made in due time of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Abel's offering did several things. I've got four or five noted here, you may see others as well, but first of all it had reference back to the disobedience committed by his parents in the garden of Eden sometime previously so it's acknowledging that secondly it acknowledged that the supreme consequence of that disobedience was that it brought the sentence of death upon them and all their descendants down the generations himself included thirdly it recognised that the eternal deity Yahweh had covered their sins temporarily through the slaying of an animal or animals, the first time they would have seen death, and the use of the skin or skins provided to cover their nakedness. Fourthly, it pointed forward, most important this, as indicated in Genesis 3 verse 15. That's the time when Eve is being arraigned before the eternal deity's representative, the Elohim. I will put enmity between thee, that's the serpent, and the woman, and between thy seed, that's the serpent's seed, and her seed, it shall bruise thy head, 
So the serpent's seed will be bruised in the head, that will be a fatal wound, and thou shalt bruise his heel. A nasty wound, but only a disabling one. <coughs> and what, what um, Cain was doing was pointing back to that. It was a reminder, it was a pointing forward to the provision of the Lord Jesus Christ who would by his perfect obedience in all points, not just most of them, but every single one, Christ was obedient, even unto a humiliating and an agonizing death on the stake, demonstrating the perfect holiness and righteousness and justice of his Father by that, and on top of that, equally important, provide the way of escape, the only way of escape, from eternal death for those who believe in him and endeavour to follow his example. By this means, Yahweh can set aside his sentence of death without violating his own righteousness and his own justice and so on. He's set out a way where we can be transferred from a death-stricken state to a life-giving state on the basis of belief and faith. And finally, it associated Abel with all of these things and thus caused him to be counted as righteous by Yahweh. His faith in what he was doing and why, why he needed to do it, demonstrated by the act of obedience. So we see Cain as the complete opposite to Abel, despite the reaction of his mother at his birth. It's recorded in Genesis 4 verse 1 that he said, I have gotten a man or the man from the Lord. That implies, of course, that she felt that this is the one that will put right that which I've messed up. Cain, the firstborn son. She thought that. That wasn't the case at all. He wasn't the one who would heal the breach between Yahweh and mankind, or between the eternal death in mankind. Instead, as we see in verse 8 of the chapter, chapter 4, he became the first murderer, the first fratricide, the first man to kill his brother. Maybe in a fit of anger, but he was still, may not have been contemplated beforehand and meditated upon and planned, but it was still a murder nonetheless. A little refraction then shows us that Cain was not a spiritually minded man. True enough, he was aware of the need to make an offering before Yahweh, before God, but he didn't appreciate that it had to be that which had been specified. It had to have reference to the things which he had mentioned in respect of Abel. Cain took of the fruit of the ground, of that medium which had been cursed, offering that to Yahweh, to the eternal deity, thus ignoring whatever instructions he had been given previously. And that's man's way, isn't it, of course? Man thinks that the eternal debt is such a one as will be pleased to accept any acknowledgement, any sort of acknowledgement of his being, as one of his creatures might be minded to make. But the eternal deity requires obedience from th those he has created, <coughs> and those he also sustains, obedience above all else. Seek to obey him, and abundant mercy is available. Refuse to do as he requires, or at least to endeavour to fulfil his requirements, and mercy is without. Cain found that out, but even as his offering was rejected, he was told how he could still find acceptance, essentially by doing as Abel's done. Do what your brother's done, you'd be okay. Offer that which I require, and I'll accept it. That was the essence of what said. But he didn't do that. We have no doubt that the fruit of the ground which Cain brought would have been the best produce which he had. We don't think he brought rotten or stuff, crab, potato and so on, but nevertheless it was still vegetables and so on, and it wasn't that which God required. In other circumstances, that sort of an offering is acceptable, but not in that particular circumstance. That is to say, if it had not been connected with the need to shed blood for the remission of sin, it would have proved to have been acceptable to Yahweh. But the requirement was there, and failing to give heed to that requirement was tantamount to a fresh rebellion. We find Cain mentioned 16 times in the Old Testament, all in Genesis 4, and3 times in the New Testament, Hebrews 11 verse 4, where his offering is shown as being less excellent than that of Abel, 1 John 3 verse 12, where he's said to be of that wicked one, namely a child of the diabolus, which is the devil, the, the adversary, the one with the false understanding and the false accuser, and that he slew Abel because his own words were evil, where his brothers were righteous. And finally in Jude 11, there Jude writes that there were men and women in the ecclesial world during, during his day, in the latter part of the first century, doing, who, had, who had gone in the way of Cain. And what was that way? It was doing that which they thought was right, which they thought was right, given by Bullinger as being natural religion, not the way that God had appointed. 
The contrast between the two brothers could not have been starker. One doing that which pleased his fleshly mind, as most of those called religious do nowadays, and the other doing that which pleased the eternal deity. So then let us draw our thoughts to a conclusion by asking why it was, and why it still remains the case, that faith is pleasing to the God of all mankind, to the one who created us all, to the one who sustains us all. Faith is pleasing to him. Now you recall that in ascertaining what the word faith meant, we looked at the illustrated Oxford Dictionary where we learned that the first meaning was complete trust or confidence. There were three other meanings given, which are all helpful, but we said that all the meet the definitions can be summed up in that first one specified. Complete trust or confidence, trust and confidence. And that pleases the eternal deity. When we looked at the meaning of faith in Bible terms, we found that the word appeared 244 times in the New Testament. The same word in 243 of them. And it's a word which means conviction of the truth of anything. And we found that it is related to God with the conviction that God exists and is the creator and the ruler of all things, the provider and bestower of eternal salvation through Christ. Thus we concluded that the Bible meanings and that of the dictionary amounted to the same thing, complete trust or confidence. With that in mind, come with me to the letter we had, or part of it, had read uh, as our opening remarks to set the, the tone as it were for what we're going to say. Hebrews 11 and the first few chapters. That chapter is, as you, as you probably know, known as a faith chapter because in it are listed a whole host of men and women who display complete faith in God often in very, very difficult circumstances, sometimes in circumstances which were threatening to their life or their well-being. So it's called the faith chapter. And what do you see, see in the opening of this chapter? What did Paul say as he began this very powerful testimony? Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Just what does this mean? Let's seek to analyse these words to draw out the meaning intended. Faith equals complete trust or confidence. Substance equals foundation, according to Grimthay in his dictionary. who puts the word foundation explaining previous comments. A setting or placing, placing under, a thing put under, substructure, foundation. Evidence, the Greek word is elekos, pronounced elengos, not spelt that way, but that's how it's pronounced with an NG in it, meaning proof or conviction. Grimthay has it that that by which individual things are proved and we are convinced of their reality. Put these together and we learn that complete, complete trust or confidence is the foundation for being convinced that the invisible things we learn of are real, even though we do not yet see them. That foundation is not that of being credulous people easily deceived, no, indeed, not that. But of those who weigh the evidence which is available with regard to Bible teaching, who consider the lives of those recorded within its pages, who are aware of the promises which God has given to faithful men and women in the past, who can read of the fulfilment of many of those promises and see the movements in the world around us which point to the fulfilment of those still outstanding, and thus believe that what God has said will happen it will indeed take place. <coughs> in Hebrews 11 verse 6 we can read, But without faith it is impossible to please God. He that cometh to God must believe that he is, and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Now that must epitomise all those men and women who wish to be pleasing to the eternal deity. The recognition that he exists, and that he will be found of those who diligently seek him. There is little recorded about Abel, but what does appear emphasises that his offering was accepted by Yahweh, and thus it must have been in accordance with that which had previously been revealed, and that Yahweh bears his own witness that Abel was a righteous man, and he did that then, as recorded now in Hebrews, by his acceptance of his offering. So it's an outstanding testimony to Abel that although the best part of 6,000 years have gone since the things recorded in Genesis 4 took place, they can still be of encouragement 
an instruction to any who wish to learn of the ways of God. Thus the first human death is instructive to us. It speaks of obedience. It speaks of the righteous act of a younger son. That's a theme which occurs again and again in Scripture. The younger son outdoing the elder son without perhaps in any, any intent to do that. It speaks of jealousy as it's so easily aroused even without the intent to cause it. And it tells us about the inherent sin which resides in us all. You may think of other lessons also, but overriding them all is that one which shows that mankind is not free to worship in any way which it chooses. The eternal creator has revealed the way, the way he wishes to be worshipped. <coughs> and that way elevate, elevates him, it elevates him to the highest possible place. And linked to that, in the same way, it abases man and makes him accept the place of a subservient supplicant for divine mercy and focuses our minds upon the role of the Lord Jesus Christ without whom all hope of human salvation would not exist. And you know what? <coughs> the place of understanding what it is which pleases eternal deity begins with an appreciation of the reality of the nature we all bear. Without exception, there's not been a man born who's not had this nature, including the Lord Jesus Christ. Sin stricken and subject to death, with death meaning what it appears to be, the cessation of existence except for the resurrection from the grave in consequence of the superlative obedience of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we can get a right understanding of that particular basic fact, then there's a real prospect that the rest can then be put in place. We need that fact to minister first, that we're mortal, that we're subject to death, and that without divine intervention, that's the way we'll go. That's a basic element of faith, and that's something we need to work on. Abel understood that, and so can we, if we apply our minds to it.